Okay, let's, can everybody hear me in the back? This is working? Good. Looks like we retained many of you from yesterday. I didn't scare you enough? Or did you have too much fun? Okay, we'll have more fun today, hopefully. Uh, just a couple of announcements. You must have received the email Juan sent, or emails Juan sent. How many people received those emails? Okay, good. If you haven't, either you haven't checked your email or something is not working for you, so you'd better check your email first. Uh, that e uh, two, the, the emails contain the website for the course, which should have all the information, including which books are required. If they're not there, Juan will make sure that they will be there. Uh, and also, it will have links to slides, like the slides I used yesterday should be there. And once the videos are available, we will have links to videos in both YouTube. And then you can actually find the videos on the ETH uh, video portal as well. I'm not sure if they're available at the moment, but they will be available after we vet them. Uh, okay, so everything related to the course is on the website. And the second thing is you, you should have instructions in your mailbox talking about how to sign up for the different sessions, basically lab sessions, which will start the week of March 5th, I think. But that's also in your email. Okay? Any burning questions related to this? Hopefully it's too early to ask questions at the, about that. Okay, good. Cool. So we'll continue what, where we st uh, stopped yesterday. Uh, I didn't cover, get into the mysteries in computer architecture, but we'll, we'll have more fun today, basically. <laughs> of course, hopefully it'll be interesting uh, to everyone. So we were, remember, we asked this question, how do problems get solved by uh, electrons, right? And we answered it, and we said, you need to communicate with the electrons somehow, because we do not speak electron language. We have built this transformation hierarchy levels that enable us to translate the problem at diff using different steps all the way into the electron language, right? This is the transformation hierarchy or transformation layers, if you will. And we said that computer architecture, a narrow view of computer architecture is somewhere over here. A more expanded view of computer architecture actually spans across all the way from algorithms and devices, and that's exactly what's happening in most of the systems that we see today. Actually, where is this? I keep using this as an example, but this is a perfect example of a computer architecture that spans all the way from algorithms to the devices. Maybe they don't change the electrons yet. But you know that people play with electrons also, right? That's what nuclear fission and nuclear fusion is all about. And people play with genes also today, right? That's, it's, it's a similar analogy, I think. Okay, uh, but yeah, I don't think it's pl uh, people play with the electrons over here, but they change the devices, certainly. This has different types of devices. Some, some memories here are volatile. They forget data if they're not refreshed. Some memories here are non-volatile. It's the salt state drive inside here. In fact, the advancements in computer architecture, the, uh, the, uh, the fact that solid state, state drives were able to become very large at very low cost is what's really enabled these devices, in my opinion. Because you can store large amounts of data. I can store 128 gigabytes over here in my pocket, basically. This was almost unimaginable 20 years ago, right? So that's essentially uh, what uh, uh, computer architecture has enabled. And it's enabled because of improvements across all the way from algorithms to devices. Okay, keep this in mind. So we're gonna talk about the expanded view, but as I said, we're gonna focus more on this part because we have only a semester in this course and you're just starting out your careers in computer science. As you move along, you will see that you will need to learn more and more across the entire stack. Okay, I'll flash the slide very quickly. I've already talked about it. You know about Richard Hamming. I'm really glad that you know about Hamming distance. And I'll keep going over here. This is just to jog your memory. We, remember we talked about what's an algorithm. An algorithm has three, three important properties. And what's an ISA instruction set architecture. We'll get back to the slide. So remember, microarchitecture and implementation of the ISA and logic, digital logic circuits, building blocks of microarchitecture. So this is where we'll, we'll start with in the course, talk about how to, the, how to come up, uh, start with these building blocks. And then we will go up to microarchitecture and ISA. Not in that exact order, but you will see why also. Okay. 
OK, uh, it's always good to think critically. What I've shown you is maybe some rigid interfaces or, uh, or some levels of transformation, as you see over here. But you can always think in a different way, right? Maybe that those levels of transformation should be deconstructed. Maybe you should really think about the user when you actually look at these levels of transformation and how it interacts with these different parts of the levels of transformation. Then you, can, you start thinking about how do I optimize the entire stack for the user. You could argue that the entire stack should be optimized for the user because in the end, I'm the person who uses this device, right? Maybe it should be customized for my behavior. Or maybe at, le at least it should be, uh, when, when people design the system, they should be thinking about me or you or whoever is using the system, right? But of course, there are many users. Users vary across platforms, different platforms. People who use these are very different from people who use Google's uh, Tensor Processing Unit, for example. You don't directly use those Tensor Processing Units, but they use their, your data, probably. Uh, so indirectly, you may be uh, inputting stuff into those Tensor Processing Units that are doing a lot of machine learning. Uh, and also, there are users that program the systems. You can see that users interact with the devices. Some users actually specify the problems. Some users specify the algorithms. Some users develop the programming languages or even write programs. Some users develop the runtime system. And some users actually develop assembly and mi develop microarchitecture. Right? How do you actually cater for all of these different users when you design a system? This is really an interesting and open question. And there is a lot of research into it, which we're not going to go into still. But I wanted to put the slide over here so that you can think a little bit critically, right? Because user was not a part of this before. But once you start putting in the user, your requirements may change. OK. OK, so why am I showing you this levels of transformation? This levels of transformation not only enables us to communicate with electrons somehow and make them do what we want them to do, but it also enables something called abstraction. So they create abstractions, essentially. And this is good. But what is an abstraction? An abstraction is a higher level, uh, basically, is the fact that a higher level only needs to know about what's coming underneath it and nothing else beyond that. So you don't need to know the uh, implementation of the lower level. You just need to know the interface to the lower level. So whenever you program, for example, you don't really need to know how a processor works, right? What's happening underneath. You learned Java. You said that yesterday. Did you need to know how the processor executes instructions? No, you didn't. Well, you will learn about it today. Not today, in this course, of course. But this was enabled because of that transformation hierarchy levels, the abstractions that we had. You just needed to know about this interface. And somebody else did the translation for you. And somebody else designed the computer that executes those instructions for you. Yeah, that's what I said over here, basically. The high-level language programmer does not really need to know uh, that, uh, what the ISA is and how a computer architecture executes instructions. And this improves productivity. That's the upside. The big upside is this is great for productivity because you don't need to worry about decisions made in the underlying levels. Imagine a world where you would actually need to control all of the signals that are happening in the computer. Well, that would not be fun to program, right? Or it would take a long time to program. So it's probably not a good idea to expose everything to everybody in the world. OK, this is another example over here. Basically, if you program in Java, for example, we discussed this yesterday, it's a higher level language. You can actually abstract things even higher level than some other languages. As a result, it's easier. You, don't, you need to know less. If you program in C, now you start thinking about, oh, how do I allocate memory? You didn't have to deal with the allocation of memory, right? You just create an object, and somebody else allocated memory for you. But when you go to C, you need to think about allocating a memory location. Now that's lower level. And your productivity probably reduced, unless you're an expert programmer. When you go to assembly, now you need to deal with, oh, where do I put this value? Which register? Which memory location? How do I, how do I translate everything I want to do into these simple primitive Instructions, add, multiply, divide. Now that's a lot more work, right? You've gone, gone below the abstraction level. As a result, your productivity probably reduces even more, unless you're an expert assembly programmer. Again, experts are very different, right? But average programmer usually doesn't, get expo doesn't become an expert in this. 
And you can go one level below binary, right? Assembly actually is still providing you uh, human readable things like add, multiply, and you can actually write add, multiply, and somebody else translates those to zeros and ones. If you actually program in binary now, you need to figure out how to write the zeros and ones that the computer can understand as the instruction encodings. Basically, you're doing the job of the assembler. But that's a lot more work right now because, I mean, it's clear, hopefully, right? OK, well, you can go even below. If somebody exposed the architecture, microarchitecture to you, now you don't just write zeros and ones that correspond to the instructions themselves, but maybe instructions, because if you look at instruction encodings, you will, we will see this. They could be 32 bits or 64 bits. So essentially, you write, for an instruction, you write a 64-bit bit string consisting of zeros and ones, specifying what that instruction should do. Yeah, maybe that's doable. But if you look at internally all of the control signals that you need to manipulate in a processor architecture that consists of maybe 50,000, 100,000 wires that you need to manipulate to make sure that every cycle it does what you want to do. Now, if you needed to program a system at that level, good luck. Right. It'll probably take years, even if you're an expert. So I will make an exception over here. Even if you're an expert, this is really difficult to do, right? Because you need to reason about what happens every single cycle in the processor. You need to feed in all of the 50,000 or 100,000 zeros and ones. Well, good luck, basically. <laughs> you're essentially simulating what the computer should do. So clearly, this may not be a really good abstraction level. But all of these are actually valid abstraction levels people have used. Maybe not in binary. People don't program as much in binary these days. Although if you're reverse engineering binary, Knowing how to program in binary could be very useful. OK. Hopefully, this is clear that the abstraction improves productivity. Right. So why are you taking this course? Right. Let's all program in Java, or even better, Python, maybe. <laughs> I don't want to be religious in the different <laughs> programming languages, but people would argue that Python is a more productive programming language than Java today. Then why do we even take this course? Why do we need to understand this? Anybody? Any guesses? Why do you care? Why are you here? Other than the fact that this is a required course. No? Yes? We know how it works under it. We know how we can use the above level much better. Exactly. So that's one reason, right? <laughs> if you know what's going on underneath, or above maybe, then you can actually become much more powerful. For example, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on uh, Google's tensor processing unit because they like to be picked on, I think. But basically, if you know how this tensor processing unit operates, you can program it in a much better way that is, such that you can become much more efficient. Similarly, there are a lot of optimizations that are employed in this where you can co-optimize the algorithm to the way, let's say, the video decoder behaves, the hardware video decoder behaves. OK, so I'll give you more examples over here. So I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll motivate in a little bit different way. Uh, so if you don't care about, so if, if basically, as long as everything goes well, maybe you don't really need to know under, what's going on underneath. But if something is not going well, then it's really important for you to know what's going on underneath. And something is not going well, maybe, oh, I've written a program in Python, and it runs like a dog. That sounds like something is not going well, right? You don't want it to sound like uh, run like a dog. You want it to it, uh, you want it to run like a cheetah. So how do you make that happen with the given hardware? Well, you'd better go down underneath. Okay. So yeah, what, basically these are some example things uh, that's uh, that are examples of what may be not going well. The program you wrote is running like a dog. By the way, dogs can run fast, so. It depends on what kind of dog you have, in this case, I think. But the program you wrote does not run correctly. That's even a more serious problem. The program you wrote consumes too much energy. That's a very serious problem over here, right? I always have this problem. Uh, your, your system just shut down, and you have no idea why. Well, good luck again. Someone just compromised your system, and you have no idea how. And you have no idea how you can protect against this. Also, taking the other side, this is, this is the software side, if you will, as a programmer side or user side. What about the hardware side? 
What if the hardware you designed is too hard to program? If you have no clue about what's going on in the upper layers, you may actually be doomed to design hardware that's useless. And we've seen that happen in the past. I'll pick on one example. I mean, I think this example is actually very interesting because it's a very nice processor that was designed by IBM. It was on, it was on my slides earlier. It was a cell broadband engine. It's the first heterogeneous multi-core processor of the world. It was designed beautifully, but unfortunately, they didn't implement in that system what's called cache coherence. Cache coherence is if one processor modified a location in a cache, which we will talk about, who ensures that the other processor sees that modification. And it's, it'd be nice if actually hardware provides this abstraction to the software saying that, programmer, you don't need to worry about it. I'll handle everything. If this processor modified this memory location, I'll make sure that this processor sees that memory location and you don't get the wrong value. Right. But they didn't have it in that processor. So it was very, very tough to program. Now, it was employed in PlayStation 2, but that line of uh, processors never got continued as far as I know uh, at the moment. But that's just one example. There has been many other examples. If your hardware is useless for the programmer, then you may quit business. <laughs> Okay, uh, or what, what if the hardware you designed is too slow because it doesn't provide the right primitives to the software? Maybe it's not useless, but you cannot make it fast enough. And we will see examples of this also uh, in the future. There, well, there, there, I'll give you one example. There was this company called Transmeta. How many of you heard of Transmeta? Okay, well, that's probably why. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway, they had actually really, really good ideas, very, very good ideas. Their goal was to compete with Intel, and they wanted to design an x86, x86 is an instruction set architecture processor that can be as fast as Intel processors. But they didn't want to make the hardware complex, so what they did was they took uh, the x86 code, and they wrote a software translation layer that translated that code to an internal microarchitecture that is extremely efficient at executing that code. And we will see that a microarchitecture later on, probably in lecture 15 or 16 or so. It's called VLIW, very long instruction word. It's very efficient. So they had a very good idea, basically. They could design the hardware really fast. All they needed to do to, uh, was to optimize this translation layer. So let me actually use this uh, board very quickly so that we can try if this gets recorded nicely. So what do I need to do over here? Close. Am I a good student? Does that work? Okay. <laughs> okay, basically, basically you have this x86 program. Normally what happens, an, X86, an Intel processor, what it does, Intel or AMD, it essentially ex it takes that program uh, and executes it in hardware. So hardware directly interprets the instructions. What Transmeta tried to do was this. You take the x86 program, and this is actually complicated. Why is it complicated? Because this ISA is a very complicated instruction set architecture. There are many, many instructions, and they're complex instructions. You need, to actually trans, uh, you need to actually do a lot of decoding over here. What Transmeta decided to do was to have another layer over here. It's called the software translation layer. Which translated the XE6 program to an internal secret VLIW, very long instruction word. You don't need to know exactly what it is. But you just need to know that this is simple to design in hardware. Uh, VLIW, I will call it uh, ISA, instruction set architecture, as well as microarchitecture, because this concept spans both, actually, as we will see later on. So that's the idea. Why did they do that? Well, this is really hard to design. Intel, companies like Intel and AMD have made a lot of investment into this hardware. As a result, they can be really, really fast and efficient. But if you're a startup company, this is a lot of work. And you're competing with someone who has a lot of expertise. 
Well, in this case, maybe you have this expertise really well, right? This is essentially compilation expertise. You be, or translation, tra compilation uh, and translation, essentially. You take this program, maybe optimize it really well, and translate it to something internal, which you can design really simply. Fast and simple design of hardware. Sounds like a good idea, right? Make sense? Hopefully you can see the trade-offs over here. Well, what happened in the end was this was the bottleneck, basically. They figured out, after some iterations, it was a really, really well done translation layer, but they figured out still that there was a lot of overhead in this translation layer. And maybe this hardware was also not as fast enough. Maybe they didn't have a lot of techniques like we will see, like out of order execution, speculative execution. Well, they had speculative execution, but they didn't have a lot of other techniques to enhance performance over here. So in the end, if we go back to the slide, the hardware that they designed was not fast enough. As a result, they weren't able to compete with a company like Intel. It's a, a bit sad story, as, as none of you know in Fresmeta. So what they did was they actually tried to spin this as a much more energy efficient engine compared to Intel. Now, it turned out it didn't work out too well because Intel was also at that point in time designing very, very efficient microarchitectures. So now you're competing in the design of the hardware and it was very difficult to do. So that's why you don't hear about Transmeta much these days, but you can read about their papers. In fact, there's a very nice paper uh, by Alex Kleiber uh, in 2000, written in 2000, I think. You can put it in the reading list. Uh, it's the, it's, I think it's, it, they call the software the code morphing software. So it talks about the code morphing software. Okay, so, uh, so that's one example of this, basically. If you're, if you're not really, really careful about what you're doing up there, and I, I'm not suggesting they were not careful, maybe they were extremely careful, but there are also market forces that are in play over here, you may actually uh, not get the performance you want. Okay, and what if you want to design a much more efficient and higher performance system? Again, as we said today, a lot of system design is, design requires you to know algorithms and all the way down to hardware. So if you want to do that, you really need to break the abstraction layers and understand your algorithm really well and design hardware that matches that algorithm. Video decoders are an obvious example. We talked about cryptographic accelerators yesterday. Packets, uh, uh, packet routing accelerators is another one. Not only encryption decryption, but also very fast packet processing accelerators. And there are many, many other uh, examples of this. Tensor processing unit is another one. Okay, so we want to cross the abstraction layers and the goals of this course, especially the second half. First half, we're gonna build up to build up some basics so that you can actually cross the abstraction layers. But especially in the second half, uh, one of the big goals is uh, for you to understand how a processor works underneath the software layer and how decisions made in hardware affect the software and the programmer. Hopefully you'll, you'll get a glimpse of this. And the second big goal is to enable you to be comfortable in making design and optimization decisions that cross the boundaries. Initially, we will be within our boundaries, within logic layer, for example, but we will also start talking about crossing the boundaries of different layers and system components. I've already given you a couple of examples, actually. Any questions? Okay, so let's move to some mysteries then. This is the fun. Really fun part, actually. <laughs> I'll talk about mysteries because these are really good examples of why you should be worried about crossing those ext abstraction layers and knowing all the way from algorithms to uh, digital logic. And I already given you examples of this, actually. Let's, let's take another vote. How many of you are familiar with Meltdown and Spectre? Okay, that's, that's still most people. How about Rowhammer? Okay, that's good. What about memory performance attack? Oh good, I'll teach you something then, most of you. <laughs> I think there's one who's familiar over there who's laughing. <laughs> That's good. What about refresh? How many of you know that uh, the fastest memories we have today forget data? Yeah, some of you. So you need to periodically refresh it and you waste a lot of energy just to keep the data intact in memory. 
So we'll talk about these mysteries. So there are mysteries if you don't know what's going on underneath or above. Okay, let's start with this first mystery. This mystery looks scary. And I'm not going to give you all of the, of course, in none of these mysteries, I'm not going to give you uh, exactly the solutions or the problems. Maybe in some of them I'll allude uh, to it. But I don't expect you to fully, fully understand all of these mysteries at the moment. This is just to motivate you and also give you a higher level understanding uh, of uh, how things behave and how these specific things affect what we do. And also motivate you to actually study further and think critically and think more deeply. Okay, let's start with these. So this is my summary, basically. These are attacks, these are vulnerabilities. And these are vulnerabilities that are really interesting because someone can steal secret data from your system, or from almost any system today, even though your program and data are perfectly correct. There is no problem with what you've written, and your data is perfectly correct. There are no bit errors anywhere. Your hardware behaves according to the specification. So your hardware is really correct according to what the manufacturer really promised you. And there are no software vulnerabilities or bugs. Someone can steal, still steal your data. So these are not very traditional security attacks which usually exploit some software vulnerability, right? There's some bug in your browser and somebody exploits that bug and gets your secret data. That's not the case. Here, there are no real bugs, okay? So why is it happening? So if you were given this problem, how would you figure out what's happening? Well, you need to really know a lot in this case, actually, to be able to understand that. And hopefully, by the end of this course, you'll be very close to that a lot. Okay, so these are basically hardware security vulnerabilities that essentially affect almost all computer chips that were manufactured within the last two decades, and maybe even longer. Two decades is 20 years or so. So they exploit, as we've discussed yesterday very briefly, what's called speculative execution. I also talked about what speculative execution is, but I'll talk a little bit more about that right now. So essentially, this is a technique that's employed in modern processors to get high performance, make things really fast, execute programs really fast. So what's speculative execution? In the most general sense, it's doing something before you know that that something is really needed. And we do it all the time in life, right, uh, to save time. For example, if I'm going on a trip that spans two weeks, and if I don't fully know exactly what I'm, what I'm supposed to wear over there, I pack a lot of things, right, speculatively. Or if I don't know the weather, maybe I pack my raincoat as well as my ski pants, dot, 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 many, many things at the same time, right? That's speculative execution for you. You guess what might happen, and you act based on that guess. And if the thing happens, what you've done is useless. Uh, well, if the thing ha actually happens as you guessed, what you've done is good, and then you haven't wasted time. Why haven't you wasted time? Because if you didn't guess, if you said, oh, I don't know what's going to happen, I'm not going to pack anything, I'm just going to go there, figure out the weather, and based on the weather, I'm going to buy my clothes over there. Well, that's a lot of work, right? It takes a lot of time. So if you actually guessed and packed accordingly, even though you may have done some useless work, you save time if actually what your guess was correct. That's speculative execution, right? And we do it all the time, consciously or unconsciously. Well, processors, well, yeah. Processors do it too to run programs fast. The principle is exactly the same. Guess and do speculatively, and execute code speculatively. If you're correct, no problem. Everything is correct because you've done the right thing. If you're wrong, you've done the wrong thing. So you just need to ensure that what you've done doesn't get exposed to the users. Right. That's the idea of speculative execution. OK, let me give you an example. Uh, so this is one example I just cooked up. I don't know who writes this code, certainly not me. But there may be some people who write this code, right? If your account balance is zero, you do something. If your account balance is less than one million, you do something else. Otherwise, you do something else. And this, this might actually expose some secret data. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But basically, what a computer does when it's executing this code is it predicts what the account balance is. And we will see why exactly. I'm not going to give you why 
it's done because it really requires understanding of why you make things high performance, blah, blah, blah. Just assume that the computer predicts the account balance. The account balance is predicted to be, I don't know, let's say greater than one million for whatever reason. Then the computer speculatively executes this code, and then later it checks whether account balance is actually correctly predicted. Well, you may ask, why does the processor not know what the account balance is? Why does it have to predict? Just like what we've uh, discussed, right? If you're going on a trip and you don't know what's going to happen, the processor has a similar thing. Because the account balance may be stored far away, somewhere else. You're processing the, this code. It requires account balance. It may be stored in, I don't know, in the cloud. So it takes a long time to access. Or it may be stored in the SSD. It still takes a long time to access because it's much slower than the processor's memory itself. So you need to speculatively execute so that while waiting for the account balance, you do something, you do something basically, and if your prediction was correct, you're passed. If your prediction is not correct, you roll back. So basically, guess what code will be executed and executed speculatively. It improves performance if it takes a long time to access this account balance, as I just said. Now, if the guess was wrong, what do existing processors do? They basically say, OK, I did something wrong. I flushed the wrong instructions and execute the correct code. Basically, what they've done is really invisible to the user. So for example, if I'm expecting, if I'm the user who wrote this program, it runs perfectly for me. Even though underneath there is speculative execution that makes it fast, I never get a wrong answer because the, it never exposes, the processor never exposes the wrong speculative execution to me. If it did, it would be terrible, right? I would get all kinds of wrong results, and I cannot trust the computer. Basically, the processor obeys this contract, instruction set architecture, the interface. The programmer assumes that the processor will execute this code sequentially, and it will never execute the wrong thing in sequential order. So if you actually execute programs in sequential order, which we will talk about, every instruction is executed before the previous, uh, before the, uh, uh, so every instruction is executed at a, at a given time, and no instruction after that is executed before the previous one completes. That's sequential execution. That's the abstraction that's provided to the programmer. And that's perfectly fine. That assumes no speculative execution, right? That's a very easy to reason about. Now, underneath, in the microarchitecture level, you can do anything else. You're free, as long as you obey this abstraction. Right. What do you do? You execute instruction in a different order, speculatively. You could do it in a random order, as long as you obey this abstraction. Right? Remember, what really matters is what you report to the user. And this is going to be very critical in what we will see in the future, also. But the microarchitecture reports the results as expected by the programmer. So even though it may execute this code, some wrong part of the code, because it predicted this account balance incorrectly, eventually it executes the correct code, and it never exposes what it did incorrectly to the user. So that sounds perfect, right? In fact, this is the basis of speculative execution and out-of-order execution that has been employed for a long time. And this is very good because it improves performance. Now, what people have discovered with Meltdown and Spectre is what I essentially said. This is absolutely correct. Even though you have this correctness everywhere, you still lose secret data. Somebody can attack you and exploit the fact that the computer speculatively executed the code. Well, why? Let me give you the high-level overview very quickly. Basically, it turns out the speculative execution, the, what the computer did on the wrong path, when it's incorrectly executing the code because it predicted something incorrectly, that execution leaves traces of secret data in the processor's cache. So we haven't talked about cache as much, but cache is essentially, well, I guess let's go back to this. So there should be an automatic way. Whenever I click on this, it should automatically close the shutter and do this wall thing, right? That's machine learning for you. But apparently, we're not there yet. <laughs> OK, so you have this processor. I'll call the CPU. 
You have the memory, main memory. You have the SSD. And I'm just going to make it up, but you have the network over here. Something like this. It doesn't need to be exactly correct. But it is not important to our point. But it turns out there's some internal storage in the processor that's called a cache. How many of you know about the cache? OK, good. I don't need to draw this picture. Most of you know. But this is fast because it's small and it's, uh, in a different technology than this. This is slow. This is slow. And this is really slow. Right? So if you want to make things fast, you bring data into the cache such that you can access it fast. Now, this is not visible to the programmer. The programmer doesn't see the cache. So internally, the processor can do whatever it wants. The programmer sees the main memory. It's visible to the programmer. The programmer sees the SSD. The programmer sees the network. But this part is not visible to the programmer. So whenever the processor speculatively executes a program, it brings data during that incorrect execution into the cache. It brings all the data. It could be secret data because execution was incorrect, right? You're never going to report that. But you leave traces of that secret data into, in the cache because you're assuming that this is not visible to somebody else. Maybe that's a wrong assumption. OK, so let's go back over here. Essentially, that's the problem. Now, you actually expose some secret data into this microarchitectural structure called cache. OK, that's better. And now, you've opened up, basically, you brought some data that you're not supposed to be brought or accessed if there was no speculative execution. Let's think of it that way also, because if there was no speculative execution, you're obeying the exact thing that the programmer wants, and you never execute something wrong. OK. Now, because you've done this, a malicious program can, with sophisticated techniques, inspect the contents of the cache to infer that secret data that it's not supposed to access. Now, this part you will not be able to understand very easily, I think. But, uh, but this, these attacks are sophisticated because they actually bring together many, many things in security and microarchitecture. And what is worse in these attacks is not just this. Maybe you can say, oh, what's the probability of this? Well, a malicious program can actually force another program to speculatively execute code that leaves traces of secret data in the cache. Again, by exploiting the microarchitectural issues in the processor. So you can force another program to go on the wrong path execute some incorrect code that you want, that you know is going to bring secret data into the cache, and then you can now inspect the contents of the cache and get that secret data. That could be your password, bank account, blah, blah. That's some, that malicious program is not supposed to access. It doesn't have permissions to access. Make sense? So everything is legal here. Everybody is accessing everything based on the permissions that they have. <laughs> Make sense? But there is a side channel. So essentially, processor cache is a side channel. What is a side channel? Well, speculative execution leaves trace of data in the processor cache. You have architectural correct behavior with respect to specification. However, this leads to a side channel, a channel through which someone sophisticated can extract information. Basically, you're extracting this information on the side. Right? That's why it's called a side channel or a covert channel as well. Basically, processor cache leaks information by speculatively uh, by storing speculatively accessed data. Does that sound coming from me? I don't think so, but OK. OK. And a cl clever attacker can probe the cache and infer the secret data values. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Otherwise, we will be talking about this for the entire lecture. I'll give you some pointers in a little bit that I find are good. But you may not be able to fully understand everything. But by the end of the course, I would expect you to understand most of these attacks, actually. So why, uh, let me give you a little bit more detail. Basically, how can the clever attacker probe the cache and infer the secret data values? Well, it turns out you can measure how long it takes to access the data. You can infer the value of a bit, 0 or 1. Whether, uh, you can infer whether something is present in the cache by measuring how long it takes to access a particular address. 
If it hits in the cache, remember. Is that coming from me? Oh, okay. You should have said that earlier. <laughs> now we have another problem. Noise cancellation. Okay, that's better. So basically, if the value you're looking for, if the address you're looking for hits in the cache, it's going to be fast. If the value you're looking for, if the address you're looking for is not in the cache, it's slow. It's going to come from memory. And we said that it's slow. So by probing the cache, asking the cache, oh, is the access that I have to this address fast or slow, fast or slow, fast or slow? And by doing that for many, many addresses, you can guess what secret data was actually loaded into the cache. Now, it's more sophisticated, but I'm not going to go into the details of it now. OK, and we said that a clever attacker can actually do much worse. It can force a program to speculatively execute code and leave traces of secret data in the cache. And this happens, actually. Uh, there are multiple ways it could happen. But we will talk about how the processor guesses what to execute. Because there must be a mechanism to guess what code to execute, right? This is called branch prediction. And the processor usually looks at the history of how the program behaved in the past to guess which one of these to execute. Let's go back. So how do you guess, actually, which one of these to execute in this simple case? You guess the account balance. How do you do that? Maybe you look at the past values of account balance, right? That could be one way. Now there's a mechanism in the processor called branch prediction that actually enables you to do that, to do that guess. And it turns out if your branch prediction mechanism can be interfered with by some other malicious program, they can make you guess something that you don't really want to guess. So some other program is executing. This other program that potentially can access secret values is executing. This program maliciously interferes with the guessing mechanism in the hardware and forces this program to guess wrongly and execute some code that would leak information. Make sense? So this happens because multiple programs actually share the processor today. They can actually execute concurrently. We will see that in one of the other mysteries in a little bit. So there are multiple issues that are going on here. That's why these things took a long time for people to discover. And you can read more about this. This is actually one of the people, multiple groups discovered this concurrently. But this is a nice blog post from Google Project Zero that explains essentially reading privileged mem memory with a side channel. Right. And you can read these details. There's a, it's a long blog post. OK, so let me ask you three questions, uh, since why are, we, why are we talking about this again, right? Can you figure out why someone stole your secret data if you do not know how the processor executes a program? Well, good luck. In this case, you will never be able to figure out if you don't know how the underlying processor works. Can you fix the problem without knowing what's happening underneath? Again, what are the fixes? We're not, we haven't even talked about how do you fix this problem yet. But you can think about, potentially, but uh, maybe later in the course. Can you fix the problem well or fundamentally without knowing both software and hardware design? I would argue that this is also very difficult. You need to know both software and hardware. In fact, if you want to construct this attack, you'd better know both really, 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 really well. And these people who constructed the attacks, they knew about microarchitecture. They knew about software. They knew about multiple, uh, multiple programs executing together and how they interfere with each other. They knew about speculative execution clearly. And they knew about how to do the side channel attacks. Side channel attacks are actually a purely software mechanism that exploits the microarchitecture to get the data you want, to infer the data values in the cache. So you really know, need to know essentially everything. <laughs> OK, so there are the other questions. What are the causes of meltdown on Spectre? Can you answer this without knowing what's going on underneath? I don't think so. How can you prevent them while keeping the performance benefits of speculative execution? Speculative execution actually has both a lot of performance. That's why it's being employed in high performance processors. Do we get rid of it? Well, maybe that's not a good idea, right? Do we go back to low performance processors just to be secure? Some people may argue that. Or some, in, some, in some design points, maybe that's OK. But usually not, I would argue. Because we want to even have higher performance. So how do you actually fix this? Software changes, operating system changes, instruction set architecture changes. 
Maybe you redefine the instruction set architecture somehow? Let me finish this mystery and then I'll give you your 15 minutes after we're done with this mystery. Uh, Microarchitecture, hardware changes. Do you do change at multiple layers cooperatively? Well, I'm not going to answer any of these questions at the moment. And how do we design high performance processors that do not leak information via such side channels? That's actually a research question at the moment, but it requires people to understand what's going on across uh, the stack. So basically, if you look at Meltdown and Spectre, both the problem and the solution space actually really span across all of these. If you really go to the nitty and gritty of it, logic gates are involved. Actually, one of the big causes of Meltdown is uh, how fast you can make one of your pipeline stages, which we will talk about later on. Uh, it turns out people wanted to either design it simply or they said, oh, I, don't, I cannot add another check, another permission check over here because it will make my clock cycle longer. As a result, they didn't check something. Again, architecturally, there's no problem. The processor is correct, except nobody expected that that lack of check would lead to the side chain. Right? So there's logic involved over here also. And clearly in the attacks, there are algorithms involved. OK, so the takeaway is breaking the abstraction layers between components and this transformation hierarchy levels and knowing what's underneath really enables you to understand and solve the problems. This is how you can really understand and solve. And you can also understand and critique cartoons. How many of you have seen this cartoon? Oh, okay, some of you did. You, are, you guys are X, XKCD fans? Okay, so this cartoon, I will leave it up during the break. You can read it during the break. Uh, and you can actually critique it because some things are not perfectly correct over here, I think. But it's good. It's a good cartoon. But basically, uh, okay, yeah. Do you want to read it right now together? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I heard it, yeah. So basically, this, uh, this person, this guy says, the meltdown on Spectre exploits use, uh, use speculative execution. What's that? And the girl says, you know the trolley problem. Well, for a while now, CPUs have basically been sending trolleys down both paths, quantum style, while awaiting your choice, which is not terrible explanation. It's, it's okay, actually. Then the unneeded phantom trail trolley disappears. This is basically the wrong path execution that you've done incorrectly. The phantom trolley isn't supposed to touch anyone, but it turns out you can still use it to do stuff. That's actually a good explanation, I think. It doesn't touch anyone. It doesn't really get exposed to anyone, but somebody else can see it, and it can drive through walls. That sounds bad. Honestly, I've been assuming we were doomed ever since I learned about Rowhammer. We'll talk about that in a little bit. What's that? If you toggle a row of memory cells on and off really fast, you can use electrical interference to flip nearby bits. And do we just suck at computers? Yep, especially shared ones. So shared ones, because to, if you have multiple programs, one can attack the other one, right? So you're saying the cloud is full of phantom trolleys armed with hammers. Yes, that is exactly right. OK, I'll uh, install updates. <laughs> Good idea. I'm not sure if that's the only solution, <laughs> installing updates, but that probably helps uh, the problem, assuming the updates are good, right? Because the updates may not be good also. OK, let me finish this. <laughs> Give me a little bit more. So an important note over here, the design goal and mindset. And I'd like to point out the mindset over here. So the design goal of a system determines the design mindset and evaluation metrics. We talked about design goals, right, before. Meltdown and Spectre are fundamentally there because the design goal of cutting-edge processors em employed everywhere in our lives has been overwhelmingly focused on high performance. High performance, high performance, high performance, high performance. And more recently, low energy also, because you need high performance and low energy over here. That's why these systems are actually some of the most interesting systems today, because they require both high performance and low energy. Okay. And the design goal has not included security. Not as much, at least. I mean, there was awareness of it at some level, but security was never a first-class constraint in the design of the processors. Or information leakage, which is an example or a sub-area sub of security. So incorporating security up as a first-class constraint and metric into hardware design and education is critical in today's world. That's why I'm actually giving you this as one of the first mysteries. And this was actually how I started the lecture yesterday. Right? 
Okay, so what's security? We will not talk about this in detail, but this is an example that I keep using. Because I think this is a really good example. These people look really happy, right? But there's something looming underneath. <laughs> they can fall easily over there, even though they may actually not be thinking about it. <laughs> so security, I think, is about preventing unforeseen consequences. This is actually a very broad definition. But I think it's a really, really good definition of security today. Because nobody foresaw the consequence of speculative execution and the design we have in processors today. And having this mindset is perhaps a much stronger mindset to design future platforms with. So two other goals in this course will be enable you to think critically. Critical thinking meaning questioning everything. Are we doing this right? Are we doing this right? And also being open to new ideas. Oh, what if I tried this? Would it work? And doing that relatively quickly. It's actually the, having the ability to think critically and failing fast with wrong ideas is a really, really good skill for innovation. And also think broadly, and I, I think you've seen that uh, in the previous examples over here. Uh, you need to think broadly across different levels of the stack. Okay, so if you want to discover further, we will get back to this later on in the course, but there are actually some good videos that I will recommend. There's a very high level video by Red Hat that gets it right, I think in terms of Meltdown and Spectre. And it's, it's three minutes, I think, it's relatively short. And there's a lower level but comprehensive explanation by uh, uh, Ymir Vikfikson. I probably butchered his name, sorry about that. But he's a professor at Emory University. And I found this video that actually explains it really nicely. Uh, you don't need to know a whole lot of details, but, but he takes 16 minutes or so. <laughs> Okay, and keep attending lectures and taking all the material. Feel free to come talk to me in the future after you developed an interest, because we have many bachelor's and master's projects on hardware security, actually. And fundamentally, secure computing architecture is actually a key direction in scientific investigation and design today that critically affects what we can do today, basically. Okay, so now I'll give you 15 minutes. Let's be back at 2.22. Okay, so we're done with the first mystery, and we're running late. I planned for four mysteries. I think I talked too much about Transmeta, but that's okay. That's important for you also to know. So let's jump into the second mystery. Remember the first mystery actually alluded to the second mystery, talking about Rohammer in this uh, cartoon, right? So let's, let's look at why we're doomed, if you believe that. <laughs> well, it must be, it's a, it, you, you must believe it because it's on the internet, right? That's exactly the opposite of thinking critically. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. It used to be books, but nobody reads books these days. Now it's the internet, everybody believes the internet. <laughs> okay, uh, so Rohammer, is this another mystery? That's my question here. So this is what I call actually DRAM disturbance errors. But basically, this is a story of how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a system-wide security vulnerability. And this is the story of people writing uh, things like this as early as 2016. But this was discovered much earlier, actually. Uh, basically, they say, forget software. Now hackers are exploiting physics. And this will hopefully become a little bit more clear uh, as to why. So what is Rohammer? Essentially, it's a disturbance error. What is a disturbance error? Whenever you're reading or writing to a memory location, you're disturbing something else around it. And this is very, very common in many, many memories, actually. And we have found out that it's very common in DRAM, which is the main memory that we've seen over here. It's this one, basically, right? <laughs> But it is also true that it's common in SSDs, it's common in hard disks, which is not shown here. But it's not a big problem in those devices because they're not exposed to outside as much. Okay, let's see what this is first. So if you actually, uh, memory consists of rows of cells, we will see this a lot more later in the lecture. But right now, abstract it this way. You have these rows of cells and you have many, many rows. If you want to access a row, you need to activate that row. What does this mean? You apply high voltage to what's called a word line. 
And you, the application of that high voltage enables the memory cells inside this row, many, many cells, let's say eight kilobytes of cells, and enables you to read all of those cells. Now, you can close this row if you're done with reading. You can apply low voltage to it. Now, it turns out, if you keep doing this repeatedly, so this is what you need for a read, activate, and then pre-charge when you're done with the read. You're just reading. You're not even writing to memory. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, blah, blah, blah. It turns out that in most DRAM chips, memory chips that you buy today, you get errors in adjacent rows. Not the same row, but rows that are immediately adjacent to this row. You don't want that, right? You don't want a bit over here to flip from one to zero. It could be your bank account. <laughs> that sounds bad. <laughs> you immediately go from a million dollars to zero. <laughs> well, Swiss francs. Swiss francs are better to have these days, right? Compared to dollars. OK, essentially, this is the failure mechanism. Basically, what we've done is we've hammered the row. It's called hammering the row because you keep doing this activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge. And you cause these poor victim rows to lose some of the correct data that, you, that they used to have. And it turns out you can do this on most real DRAM chips you can buy today. And this paper of ours actually details in uh, how you can do it. OK, so it turns out you, more than 80% of the chips that you've tested from three major manufacturers of DRAM, and there are three major manufacturers of DRAM in the world today, uh, are vulnerable to these uh, effects. So why is this happening? We'll get back to why this is happening. But the reason th this is happening is things are too close to each other. All of these little memory cells, you can abstract them away as circles, if you will. Whenever you activate some of them, whatever you're doing with high voltage over here is affecting the cells that are around you. So you're really disturbing your neighbor. It's like a nosy neighbor. One of the manufacturers, actually, they didn't like talking about this, but they started acknowledging the problem and say, oh, we have a nosy neighbor problem. This thing that we're accessing is nosy on the other neighbor, so they're affecting the neighbor. <laughs> OK, so this was not a problem in the past. So we've actually tested chips from 2008, 2009, and this shows the error rate. As you can see, error rate was zero. But now things have become too close to each other. These cells have become smaller and smaller. That's the beauty of Moore's law. With each technology generation, you can reduce the size of the cell and as a result, you get more cells in a given area. So your density is higher. You can store more things. But you're more vulnerable to effects like this now. Because things are close to each other, they disturb each other. Now you can see that all of the memory chips that were manufactured that we tested between 2000, that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 are vulnerable. Error rates are relatively high, actually. Basically 10 to the 5 over 10 to the 9. Many, many cells, right? And it's, it's independent of the manufacturer. OK, so why is this happening? I've already given you uh, the reason, actually. But basically, DRAM cells, dynamic random access memory cells, that's one type of memory. Have you heard of DRAM? OK, good. SRAM, static random access memory. These are different memory technologies, basically. You don't need to know about them at the moment, at least. But in the future, in this course, you will learn about them. Uh, you just need to know that. DRAM is used in all main memories. This has some main memory. This has some main memory. Your data center has some main memory. They all use DRAM, this technology, to store data. But the cells are too close to each other. As a result, they're not electrically isolated from each other. Whenever you access one, you affect the value in nearby cells due to electrical interference. And the electrical interference happens between the cells and between wires used for accessing the cells as well. So nothing is immune to this interference, because you're electrically injecting voltage into this, and that voltage is really affecting what's around it. This is also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling. If you've heard about coupling, that's what it is. It's interference, essentially, or voltage coupling. People say that as well. So this example, when we activate or apply high voltage to a row, an adjacent row gets slightly activated as well. Now, if this happens, vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row lose a little bit of charge. And I said vulnerable cells because not all cells are vulnerable to this. Some cells are really strong. 
Some cells are really weak. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the memory cells. And if row hammer happens enough times, if you do this hammering enough times, charge in such vulnerable cells gets drained. As a result, you lose the data. So I say charge here, right? Basically, uh, this is uh, the, the memory, DRAM memory stores data as charge. You, you inject current into the cell, and the fact that you have a lot of charge indicates that you have a one in the cell. And if you didn't inject any charge, you have a zero in the cell. That's how you can store data, basically. That's the data storing mechanism. So if you injected charge into the cell, and if someone did this to you, hammered it, it can drain the charge. As a result, a one can become a zero. Yes? Uh, does it happen in the activated cell as well? No. <laughs> I won't go into, well, I'll go into the reason, because when you activate the cell, you're essentially re replenishing the charge. Uh -huh. That's the reason, OK? <laughs> Make sense? OK, good. Again, there are lower levels you may not be fully comfortable with, but you should understand the higher levels. OK, there are higher level implications also. Basically, it turns out the simple circuit level parallel layer mechanism has enormous implications on the upper layers of the system stack or transformation hierarchy. It happens really somewhere here, right, at the device level. You could argue at the electron level also. In fact, there are some other mechanisms that we didn't really talk about. But it really has implications all the way to over here, to the user especially. <laughs> okay, let's talk about some of those implications. Okay, we're gonna have more fun here. <laughs> so how can you actually do this? Well, a simple program can actually induce many errors. Before I said activate pre-charge, but you don't normally activate pre-charge, right? That's done by some hardware components, which we will talk about again in the next mystery a little bit more. But uh, you can actually write this program that essentially selects addresses X and Y carefully and what this program does, you don't need to know x86 assembly. This is an x86 code over here. You don't need to know exactly how it works. You just need to know what it does. Basically, what it does is it avoids these cache, avoids every single caching, and it ensures that the data is accessed inside this memory. It basically does this. Activ uh, it accesses x and y, these two rows in memory, many, many times in a ping-ponging manner, in an interleaved manner. And if the chip is vulnerable, at some point you get errors. <laughs> that sounds good, right? You can actually download this program and run it for yourself. In fact, better yet, I think Google has developed a much stronger and better version of the program based on this R, R, R version. You can run that. Of course, you may need to tweak it to match your system, but it's fun if you match your system and if you see these errors. Just make sure you don't have something really critical on your system. <laughs> because you may never get back your system if this really causes some persistent error, the probability of which is really low, but it could happen. Okay, so this actually happens in real systems. We've tested real systems, and you can see that different real memory control, uh, different real systems. When you run this program on different real systems, you get a lot of errors. And the errors are correlated with how fast you can access memory in these real systems with. Okay, so that's a real reliability and security issue. Let's, let's talk about why it's a security issue. Like, why could this be a security issue? You get a bit flip, right? How bad could it be? Well, uh, if you're interested in this, I'll recommend this paper. You may not be able to fully understand it, but when we wrote this paper, uh, the first thing we said is memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system. And access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. Remember these unintended consequences, unforeseen consequences? If this happens, it causes an unforeseen consequence. Right. Basically, whenever you're reading some location memory address, you should really not be touching some other memory address. Whenever you're reading an array many, 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 many times, that should not have any effect on some other address that the array is stored next to, which could be your operating system. Right. Okay, and we said that you could actually devise an attack to take over a system by this. But while we were doing this, actually, these same Google folks, Google Project Zero, different people in the, in the same group, they reported that you can actually exploit this row hammer failure mechanism to gain kernel privileges on a Linux system. So you could actually ex take those bit flips and use them to take over a laptop. That's essentially what they showed as a user level program. And this is actually a copy paste from Mark Seaborn and uh, Thomas Dulian's 
uh, blog post. Uh, it basically, as I, I literally copy and then paste it, they say we test a selection of laptops and found that a subset of them exhibited the problem. We built two working privilege escalation exploits that use this effect. You can read the blog post by Google. One exploit uses rope hammer induced bit flips to gain kernel privileges on x86-64 Linux when run as an unprivileged user land process. So somebody injects some code or you download an app over here and that app takes over your phone, takes all your secret data, sends it to whoever. Right. That's possible basically with rope hammer. If you want to know more about this, Kaveh in the back actually has looked at attacks to do it on under Android system. So he's visiting us uh, for six months, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Okay, so well, how does this happen? Uh, when a, uh, basically, when you run this on a machine that's vulnerable to the Rohammer problem, which is more than 80%, presumably, of the machines, you can induce bit flips and page table entries. How many of you know about virtual memory? Okay, page tables, okay, memory protection, okay, maybe not so. So there are mechanisms in existing, we're not gonna go into this in detail, but you will learn more about this when you actually take the systems programming course. But basically there are mechanisms in existing systems that ensure protection. What does protection mean? A program, well, it's very similar to the meltdown inspector earlier. A program should not be able to access data that it doesn't have privileges to access. So for example, as a user, I should not have access to the operating system kernel as a random user, right? If I'm, the super, if, if I'm the administrator of the computer, maybe I should have access to the operating system kernel. As a random user in the cloud, I should not have access to the data of some other virtual machine that someone else is running, right? And that's enforced by protection mechanisms. And the protection mechanisms are supposed to guarantee that that protection boundaries are not crossed. So in this case, and so you have mechanisms that guarantee that, meaning that there has to be some mechanisms in the processor that says this process, whenever it's trying to do a memory access, it checks, oh, can I do this memory access? And the page table entry says, no, you cannot. There's a bit over there that says, you're trying to access this address that you're not allowed to access, so get out. So whenever you have, for example, you may have seen system protection exceptions in Windows. These are essentially system protection exceptions. Uh, so, what, uh, so that relies on a bit. The bit says you have access or don't, no, not have access. Now if someone row hammers that bit and changes it from a zero to one or one to zero, doesn't matter, from you don't have access to you have access, now you have access some, to some privileged location. That's essentially what the gist of this attack is. You flip that bit that allows you access to a location that you're not supposed to access. And then everything is gone, you've lost the system. And this essentially they say you were able to, you know, it was able to use this to gain write access to its own page table. Basically you can write anything to these locations that give you permissions to different places and gain read write access to all of physical memory. And once you have read write access to all of physical memory as an unprivileged user, you can do whatever you want. You can see the contents of somebody else's virtual machine that's running on the crowd. You can see the contents of whatever application that someone has and send it somewhere, okay? So this is called the DRM row hammer vulnerability and people draw pictures like this. I like this thing uh, that I found on Twitter basically. Somebody says it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming the neighbor's door and the perturbations, the vibrations that you caused because you slammed the neighbor's door actually opened the door you were really after. So you could try it on this door and see if this door opens. <laughs> Just don't try it during this lecture. Okay, so other people have actually looked at uh, taking over a system. So these folks showed that you could take over a remote system by exploiting rope hammer induced bit flips in JavaScript. I'm not gonna go into the details. And this is what I was talking about earlier these folks, including Kaveh in the back, show that you can gain control of a smart smartphone deterministically by fooling the operating system to allocate these permission locations at a place that you know is vulnerable to roll hammer. So you fool the operating system because you know how the operating system operates and you fool it to put this page table, permission table, 
into locations that you know are vulnerable and you hammer that location. Right? That sounds good. Well, maybe not so. So maybe this is another at attack that solves a problem. <laughs> you get rid of your computer. No, I'm just kidding. OK, so this is where Rolf Hammer was discovered, actually. So the things that you're going to use, FPGAs, um, my students built a lot of them to test memory. And uh, they actually discovered the Rolf Hammer problem on this particular machine that we built. This is, I think, a machine with eight FPGAs, FPGA boards. And these are all doing testing of different memories, trying to figure out, oh, which are vulnerable and which are not vulnerable. And of course, you need a heater. You need, you need actually a good scientific setup to do this testing. OK, so you can immediately ask, how do we fix the problem? I'll talk about the fixes a little bit over here to give you uh, what this problem is a little bit more about. So there are some potential solutions. Uh, and these are actually really interesting solutions also. Let's look at some of them. So make better DRAM chips. Well, clearly this problem happened because people wanted to make higher capacity DRAM chips. And this is how we get capacity, by cramming more components into the same chip. But you get these effects also. So how do you make them better? Well, they were trying to actually make things good also, but they just didn't anticipate the problem. So this leads to cost. If you want to make better DRAM chips, you need to give up capacity, and that leads to cost in the end. OK, another thing, if you actually refresh memory more frequently, well, we're going to talk about refresh later on. But if you actually, uh, essentially, the problem happens because you keep hammering, and once in a while, you lose charge. And if you do enough hammering, the locations lose charge enough that they will become a zero as opposed to a one. But if you actually periodically refresh memory very often, you get rid of this problem. Because once in a while, you replenish the charge in all of the cells in memory, and your memory looks like it's never been attacked. That sounds good, right? Well, the problem is refreshing takes a lot of power and performance, because every time you refresh, you essentially need to read the location and write it back. You can think of it that way. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Or you could say error correction. How many of you know about error correction mechanisms? OK, that's good. We talk about Hamming, right? Hamming is one of the fathers of error correction, actually. You could say, I'm going to add these special codes. And whenever a memory location changes, this code will indicate that something bad happened. And that code I will use to correct what was done. That's the essence of an error correction code. Right? And there are many, many versions of it. Hamming codes are one of them. But the downside of all of this is you need to have extra code somewhere. And you need to manage them. So that's cost and power. So these are all good solutions that you can come up with. Well, maybe do I want to talk about access counters? Let's talk about access counters too. So another solution could be you can detect this, perhaps, right? If somebody is hammering a row, maybe you add counters in the hardware or in the software that keep track of how many times you're accessing a row repeatedly. And if, if it becomes suspicious, if it becomes greater than a threshold, you say, oh, somebody's doing this hammering. So I'm going to prevent more accesses to this row. That doesn't sound too bad. Oh, I should have asked you which solutions you like, but maybe I'll ask you which other solutions exist in a little bit. So OK, the downside of this is this actually comes with cost, power, and complexity, because you need to keep track of rows that are being accessed. This is also called the frequent item counting problem. It's a theoretical problem, actually. How do you count the frequent items among many, many items you access? And people have looked at how to reduce the cost of this. It's not easy. OK. So what's the real solution that has been employed in many chips today? So I'll talk about Apple's solution. Apple released a security patch. Uh, and they say, basically, they, a disturbance there, also known as road hammer, exists within some blah, blah, that leads to memory corruption. This issue was mitigated by increasing memory refresh rates. So this thing is refreshing memory more frequently right now. So as a result, it's slower, and its energy consumption is lower, uh, more. Is this a good solution? Do you like it? Yes. I see. So you want to counter and threshold and refresh. Refresh what? Um, refresh the memory and 
I see. Only those rows that have counter greater than some threshold. Yes. So that may be a better way because they're refreshing all of memory more. So basically, the solution says, I'm going to increase the refresh rate of memory in the entire memory. It doesn't matter if your memory is if somebody's hammering or not. All the time, you're, refresh, you're refreshing a lot more. So your solution is a little bit more intelligent. Basically, it's trying to detect which rows to refresh more. Right? Yeah, you would, you would actually reduce the overhead of this. But it requires more complexity. <laughs> you need to detect. <laughs> OK. So many other vendors actually released similar patches uh, to this problem recently. So let me talk, talk you, uh, tell you about a cheaper solution. Uh, it's a probabilistic solution. And I think I'd like you to think about these solutions going into the future. Uh, basically, this is a solution we proposed in the paper that I mentioned. It's probabilistic adjacent row activation. And the idea is very, very simple. Remember, when you activate a row, you close the row. Activate pre-charge. After you close the row, you flip a coin. Of course, the coin has, let's say, a thousand sides. <laughs> uh, five out of those a thousand sides indicate that you should refresh the row. The rest indicates that you should not. Uh, you should refresh the adjacent rows. The rest indicate that you should not refresh the adjacent rows. So basically, every time you access a location. Five out of a thousand times, five out of a thousand times, you activate a location, you refresh the adjacent rows. Does that make sense? It's very probabilistic. Probability is five out of a thousand in this case. I just pulled it out over here because this, this value seems to work well. But of course, you could adjust the probability. So if it, it turns out if you do this, you, act, you refresh one of the neighbors with a low probability, you get a really, really good reliability guarantee. You get rid of most of the uh, errors, and your guarantee is much better than hard disks. So you can actually close the vulnerability by being probabilistic. OK. And you can adjust the value of p, uh, this probability, to provide arbitrarily strong protection against the errors. And you can read the paper for more detail. The overhead of this is really low. You don't need any storage, actually, if you think about it. Whenever you close a row, you just flip a coin. You just need a flipping a coin mechanism. But that doesn't need to be very expensive also. Maybe every time, five out of a 1,000 times, you say, I refresh the row. <laughs> OK, anyway. So some thoughts on row hammer. You should think probably more. But uh, essentially, this is a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And this is the first hardware failure mechanism that we know of, at least I know of, but most people know of, as far as I know. So how to find, exploit, and fix the vulnerability requires a strong understanding across the transformation layers. I've given you some solutions. Refresh, for example, solves the problem, but maybe it's not a good solution, right? In fact, Apple doesn't tell how much they increase the refresh rates. My feeling is they doubled it. I don't know for sure. Doubling the refresh rate actually causes a lot more energy consumption. And we'll talk about the fourth mystery if we ever get to it. Fourth mystery is going to be about refresh and how it's a big problem. We actually don't want to increase the refresh rate. We want to get rid of refreshes so that we can, be, we can have a much more efficient and higher performance system. So that's not a good solution. But you need to understand the transformation layers and a strong understanding of the tools available to you. The other solution that I just described, the probabilistic solution, has its own problems. Now you need to know which rows are adjacent to each other. And the memory controller today doesn't necessarily know that information. So maybe it needs to guess. OK. We'll talk more about that later. So fixing also needs to happen for two types of chips. Right? One is existing chips that are already in the field, that are already vulnerable. This thing maybe, right? or maybe this is already fixed, I don't know. <laughs> but this thing for sure, because this is old, I know. <laughs> this is from 2011. Wow, is it really that old? Maybe it's time to change it. <laughs> OK, but basically, existing chips, how do you actually solve the problem for chips that are already in the field? And future chips, how do you actually manufacture new chips that do not have this problem? These are two different solutions, right? In the field, you don't have much flexibility. Maybe Apple did the easiest and right thing, right? It was easy for them to change the refresh rates, and they did across the board, and that fixed the problem. Now, we don't know if it's fixed the problem because we don't know how much they increase the refresh rates. OK, so mechanisms for fixing are different between the two types. So I'll, uh, I'll pull back a little bit. I'll uh, talk about these a little bit more. 
But these are examples of what we call Byzantine failures. Have you heard of Byzantine failures? Have you guys heard of the Byzantine Empire? Okay, good. History. You know the Roman Empire, right? There's the West Roman Empire and the East Roman Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is the East Roman Empire. And these people had generals that were not reliable, that were always fighting against with each other and basically stabbing each other in the back by not telling the right information to each other. I'm kind of making it up, but you can read the paper over here that I'm going to reference, which is a theoretical paper. But this class of failures are known as Byzantine failures. Uh, and Byzantine failures are actually characterized by two things. Well, undetected erroneous computation, essentially. That's enough. Undetected and erroneous. <laughs> two things. You have an error, but you cannot detect it. As opposed to something called fail fast, which is actually a good way of designing systems. Fail fast means if you have an error, fail quickly, either with an error or no result. It's better than the data corruption that you have. So in general, maybe 10 generals are deciding to do something. A few of those generals are sneaky. They have erroneous computation. And they do something that the others don't know. Now, how do you guarantee that the system works correctly in that case? Erroneous can be malicious because of what I just said, right? An error can always be exploited for something bad. The only difference is really the intent. You can be erroneous, and your intent may be, you may not know about this. You can be erroneous, but you can act, you're erroneous because you're malicious. You want to actually sabotage the empire, right? So that's why there is a huge connection between reliability and security. An, an error, maybe just a benign error that leads to some wrong result, or if the intent is malicious, you can exploit that error to take over a system. OK. And these are very, very difficult to detect and confine, these Byzantine failures. And this is actually. Uh, uh, concerned distributed systems community for a long time. Actually, it's still concerning the distributed systems community. Distributed systems community talks about, oh, what if you have these n million servers in the world, and how do you ensure that they agree on a result? This is called the consensus problem. When there is erroneous computation, and how do you ensure that this is really efficient? Right. Basically, how do you get the correct result? in the presence of Byzantine failures. And Rohammer is a very good example of a hardware-based Byzantine failure. Basically, how you do this? Well, you really want to avoid <laughs> this as much as possible. Do all you can do to avoid such failures, Byzantine failures. And this is actually, if you're really, really interested, you should take a look at this theoretical paper by Leslie Lampert. Do you know about this name, Leslie Lampert? OK, you should learn about this. This is your first year. There's still more to go. Leslie Lampert uh, has done a lot of work on multiprocessor systems and distributed systems. And he's won the Turing Award for a lot of the work that he's done. And he explains the Byzant Byzantine general's problem in this uh, transactions on programming languages and systems. OK, so if you're really interested about Rohammer, you can actually download the code and enjoy. <laughs> you can download Google's code, uh, their attack and enjoy. And I'm sure there are many other codes also. Uh, so Google was actually really, uh, the, these folks were actually really, uh, did something really interesting. Basically, if you want to increase the number of errors, you don't just do hammering over here, but you sandwich the row. And you do hammering on one side and the other side. You keep hammering on both neighbors. And the row that's sandwiched in between has now a lot more errors. <laughs> that sounds good, right? <laughs> OK. And this is the paper where we described it for the first time. And I mean, this is really, really if you're interested. Like if, you're, if you cannot sleep at night for some reason, then <laughs> you say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn more about rope hammer. <laughs> so this is more recent. It's more of a retrospective that I wrote. Uh, this is shorter also. Uh, very recently, talking about the rope hammer problem, some potential solutions, some attacks that people have developed on top of it, and maybe the other problems that may be lurking in the future as memory becomes denser going forward. OK, so my takeaway, again, going back, uh, is this problem, again, spans across the layers. 
And breaking the abstraction layers between components and transformation hierarchy levers and knowing what's underneath enables you to understand unsolved problems. And these problems are, you could argue that, why do I care about this, right? This is the problem of the DEI manufacturer. They didn't do their job right. You could argue that you won't win that argument much because it's not so easy to do as, as we push technology boundaries, and you should always be pushing technology boundaries, as we push the boundaries of the technology, we will run into more reliability issues like this. And it's going to be very hard for a single group of people to confine or solve these reliability problems. So actually, I empathize with the DRM manufacturers quite a bit here because I know what goes into building those chips. And it's very, very difficult to get rid of these errors. Your SSD, for example, has a lot more of these read disturb errors. This is called read disturb also, disturbance errors, except they're not exposed to the programmer in the same way memory is exposed to the programmer. There's a lot of protection mechanisms. In fact, you, can, you have a lot of error correction codes. If you're the DRM manufacturer, you will actually keep getting these errors, and maybe the solution is actually at the system level and not at the chip level in this case. Well, I can talk more about this, but I think this is probably a good place to stop since we don't have, since I'm not going to be able to cover the next mystery in five minutes. Okay, have a good weekend. We'll see you next week. <laughs>